Hello, everyone. My name is Charo Neville, and I am the curator of the Kamloops Art Gallery, and I am honored to be joined by Candace Hopkins and Dylan Robinson this afternoon with uh, the gallery's education and public programs director, Emily Hope, is uh, providing technical support in the background. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your afternoon with us through this virtual coming together. As we gather across the wires, I'm speaking to you in my office at the Kamloops Art Gallery, which is situated on the unceded territory of the Tecumloops Te Sequatm within Sequatmak Ulu, the ancestral lands of the Sequatm people. All of this land, what we refer to as Kamloops and beyond, spanning over 180,000 square kilometers across the interior plateau of what we call British Columbia is Sequatmak Ulu. As a settler, I acknowledge my immense privilege in being able to live, play, and work on these occupied territories. The news this month of the discovery of the unmarked graves of 215 children on the site of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School has a deep impact on this community. Indigenous communities across the countries are experiencing collective grief right now. For many here, this discovery was news that was known and has now been confirmed. So with so many coping with sorrow and anger, we talked about the appropriateness of carrying on with our programming and we decided to move forward as planned in recognition of this truth and of upholding a commitment to reconciliation. With the Soundings exhibition and our accompanying programs, we see strength in coming together to amplify Indigenous voices and in having difficult conversations. For those needing emotional support or assistance, Emily will provide some resources in the chat box. And to situate us visually in the exhibition, Emily is going to run a slideshow of uh, our documentation of soundings here at the Kamloops Art Gallery, while I give a brief introduction about the exhibition. Thanks, Emily. Curated by Candace Hopkins and Dylan Robinson, soundings an exhibition in five parts, features newly commissioned scores, performances, videos, sculptures, and sound by Indigenous and other artists who respond to the question, how can a score be a call and a tool for decolonization? Unfolding in a sequence of five parts, the scores take the form of beadwork, videos, objects, graphic notation, historical belongings, and written instructions. During the exhibition, these scores are activated at specific moments by musicians, dancers, performers, and members of the public, gradually filling the gallery and surrounding public spaces with sound and action. This touring exhibition has been presented at Agnes Etherington Arts Centre at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, Gunn Gallery at Kenyon College, Gambier, Ohio, uh, Kitchener-Waterloo Art Gallery in Kitchener, Ontario, and the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC. It is cumulative gathering an ever-changing community of artworks, shared experience and engagement as it travels. Sounding shifts and evolves, gaining new artists and players in each location. Some artworks have multiple parts and others change to their own rhythm as the exhibition grows. At the core of the exhibition is a grounding in concepts of indigenous land and territory. To move beyond the mere acknowledgement of land and territory here means offering instructions for sensing and listening to indigenous histories that trouble the colonial imaginary. Sounding activates and asserts Indigenous resurgence through the actions these artworks call forth. The exhibition tour has been organized by Independent Curators International, or ICI, 
Independent Curator International, Curators International, supports the work of curators to help create stronger art communities through experimentation, collaboration, and international engagement. Curators are arts community leaders and organizers who champion artistic practice, build essential infrastructures and institutions, and generate public engagement with art. ICI's collaborative programs connect curators across generations and across social, political, and cultural borders. They form an international framework for sharing knowledge and resources, promoting cultural exchange, access to art, and public awareness for the curator's role. Soundings, an exhibition in five parts, was initially organized by the Agnes Etherington Art Center in, at Queen's University. And the exhibition and tour are made possible in part with the generous support from ICI's International Forum and the ICI Board of Trustees. Additional support has been provided by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Canada Council for the Arts New Chapter Program, the Isabel and Alfred Bader Fund of Bader Philanthropies, the Ontario Arts Council, the City of Kingston Arts Fund through the Kingston Arts Council, and the George Taylor Richard Memorial Fund at Queen's University. Finally, the Kamloops Art Gallery would also like to thank the City of Kamloops, the BC Arts Council, and the Canada Council for the Arts, as well as our many donors and members for their ongoing support. So uh, getting into the talk, just some brief notes for all of you out there. Our program will be about an hour and a half long, give or take, depending on the questions. Um, and you can submit your questions through the Q&A box and we'll address these at the end of our conversation. You're also encouraged to chat among yourselves um, and with us through the chat window. And um, please note that if you send a message to all panelists, um, that will be visible only to Candace Dillon and I, or, or you can um, set your settings to all panelists and attendees, which will be visible to everyone here. Uh, it is now my great privilege to introduce the curators of Soundings, Candace Hopkins and Dylan Robinson. Candace Hopkins is a curator and writer of Clinket Descent, originally from Whitehorse, Yukon. She is senior curator of the Toronto Biennale, uh, Biennale of Art and co-curator of the 2018 Site Santa Fe Biennale Casa Tomada. She was a part of the curatorial team for Documenta 14 in Athens, Greece and Castle, Germany, and co-curator of the major exhibitions Sakahan, International Indigenous Art, Close Encounters, The Next 500 Years, and the 200, uh, 2014 Sightlines Biennale, Unsettled Landscapes in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Candace's writing is published widely and her recent essays and presentations include Outlawed Social Life for South as a State of Mind and Sounding the Margins, a choir of minor voices at small projects, Tromso Norway. She has lectured internationally, including at the Vitte Vit, Tate Modern, Dach Art Biennale, Artist Space, Tate Britain and the University of British Columbia and she is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Hatsusan Foundation Award for Curatorial Excellence in uh, Contemporary Art and the 2016 uh, Prix pour un Sai Critique sur l'Art Contemporain by the Foundation Prince Pierre de Monaco. And she is a citizen of Carcross Tagish First Nation. Dylan Robinson is uh, Hunk Mach and writer of Stalo Descent and the Canada Research Chair in Ind Indigenous Arts at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. His current work focuses on the return of Indigenous songs to communities who were prohibited by law to sing them as part of the Indian Act from 1882 to 1951. Dylan's previous publications include the edited volumes Music and Modernity Among Indigenous Peoples of North America in 2018, 
arts of engagement, taking aesthetic action in and beyond the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada in 2016 and Opera Indigen 2011. And his monograph, Hungry Listening, was published in 2020 with uh, MIT or uh, Minnesota University Press. So thank you so much for joining me. That was a long introduction, and I know that you both want to offer your um, own land acknowledgments as well for the territories that you're situated on. Thank you, Charo. Thank you for that really thoughtful introduction. Um, also, the introduction to you know how what people are thinking and doing right now in Kamloops. Um, I just want to. Uh, put my hands up for that. I really appreciate it and appreciate, you know, this opportunity to talk about what we're going to talk about today. Um, my land acknowledgement is very brief. I'm joining you from Tiwa territory in what is now known as Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, it's also the border uh, of Navajo traditional territory as well. Um, I've been living down here for about a decade, um, but as you mentioned, originally from Whitehorse, Yukon, I'm gonna study clan of Carcross Tagish First Nation. So thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to, to speak here today. I'm, I'm excited to have this opportunity and I just also want to, um, well, to acknowledge the, the, the recent, uh, findings and, um, you know, is, is something that is also somewhat unexceptional, you know, we can we can turn back to the all of the work that that survivors and intergenerational survivors did as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and beyond that and and just but also to really extend my, um, you know, uh, best thoughts and condolences to my Shoquamek uh, relations there. Um, my heart is with you. So I will say where I'm from. Um, so very briefly, I, I said where I, I'm Stalo, but um, from more specifically from the Squaw band on my mother's side of the family. Uh, so very close there to my relatives. Um, and Shokwapmak lands. And I am now based on Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe lands in what's now called Kingston, Ontario. And I'm very glad to be here today. Thank you both. Um, I thought we could start our conversation um, extending uh, the territorial acknowledgements um, given the context that we've been talking about in soundings and the realities of um, systemic displacement from land and culture so present in our minds. Um, and so I thought I would um, start a conversation with a discussion about your curatorial prompt for soundings uh, to act as a call or a move beyond mere acknowledgement. Um, so in your minds, uh, for this is a question for both of you, um, how does soundings enact, activate, and assert ind Indigenous resurgence? And um, how does this connection between land and language manifest in the exhibition through this curatorial framework? Did you want to begin, Dylan? I can add. <laughs> yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to, you know, part of Part of I think the the material that circulates with the exhibition is is the is this phrase you know calls to decolonization and I think you know I, that word sits very ambivalent with me a lot of the time um, even though we we've used it in this context but it does because I think more and more decolonization is understood as a kind of 
um, checklist or, or something that's realizable things that can be done, like that will solve the problems, right? And um, if anything, I think decolonial work is a process, right? And so it's a process that uh, takes time and that changes as you move through the process and takes different directions. And so for me, there's a kind of, there's a synergy there um, with the way in which uh, many of the works, all of the works in the exhibition ask for different processes to unfold. None of them oriented towards, you know, do this thing and we will achieve decolonization, <laughs> obviously, um, but more toward the kinds of work of language learning, of resurgence, of thinking through what sound and listening mean from different Indigenous perspectives, um, spending time with listening um, from a different, different um, Indigenous frameworks. And it's that work, it's those, it's those processes of spending time and of, of centering Indigenous knowledge, I think, that are held alongside this word decolonization. Um, in a in a kind of it's still in an ambivalent way, but but I think I think it's important. I think it's important to sort of push beyond what that word has come to mean. I think unfortunately, from a lot of institutional perspectives, towards something that is much more process based and and time based. Yeah, I was going to say something similar, Dylan. Thanks for for providing that framing. You know, the question that we asked early on is whether sound can be a tool for decolonization. But the more I think about it, I actually wonder if the question or an additional question should be, can listening be a tool for decolonization? On one hand, um, I was thinking of that question, you know, and Dylan and I, we've talked about this in the, in when we first started thinking about um, soundings when it was just the genesis of an idea over, you know, phone calls. And I remember, you know, writing the grant. I was in a hotel room in Montreal when we were still allowed to travel <laughs> and thinking about whether it's possible to frame an exhibition like a score in that it can be instructional, it can be open ended, it can have multiple players. We don't necessarily decide what how things are enacted actually it kind of like sets something in motion what does that mean what does that mean to actually have an exhibition that can potentially transpose even the very idea of agency um, so that was a question as well that i think kind of comes from this framework but in thinking about circling back to that question of whether sound can be a, a tool for decolonization i think i, I was so struck by it because of what I was witnessing, what I was witnessing in 2012, 2013 with the Idle No More movement, what I saw in that, or what I heard in that, let's say, were people gathering, singing songs. I loved that they were in, you know, the most, what we would consider the most banal places like shopping malls. And they were deliberately there because these are places of public gathering. And then and then I heard the songs that were being sung uh, when Bo Dick and his collaborators uh, took part in Lala Canis, you know, walking first from his community in Alert Bay to Victoria to call attention to uh, commercial uh, salmon farming and how that was detrimental to wild stocks. But then, you know, through his daughters pushing him, doing this trek, this journey from Alert Bay to Parliament Hill and they're singing songs and breaking copper. And I thought, actually what I need to be paying attention to are these sounds. The actions are important, but it's also these sounds because it's actually the songs that are bringing people together. So then I was thinking more about how songs always have had that function. And I think with sound, we might even start parsing out the decolonial from the non-colonial. And I know Dylan, you think about this in your work a lot. So then when we were thinking of the framework for, for soundings, it was a question that we posed to artists as well, because I think perhaps more important than us answering that, I think it's it's even more interesting to see how artists respond to it. It's not, it's not really a question of answering it, but it's how you respond to it. And I think that what artists have done in soundings is respond in various ways to that as a prompt. 
And I think also in terms of the the works doing things, right? Mm -hmm. they, they continue this tradition for me, a lot of the works, um, as you were mentioning, right? Our, our songs are, are they're are, they are so much more than songs often, right? As medicine, as primary historical documentation, as legal orders. And I think in this, the, I think the kinds of sounding and the kind of um, work that takes place from these prompts, uh, a, you know, d does things beyond the artistic work, right? I, I, I do, I do truly believe that. You know, there, there, there's something, um, yeah, really, really powerful about about the way in which. Um, I don't want to say that you know the, the the artistic thinking of it as an artistic work reduces it, but it, instead that it actually does it does kind of work above the aesthetic capacity of of what it is. Yeah, for me, that really happens through the activation part. So you're asking artists to respond and be part of this exhibition, but then they're asking other people to respond, um, which is very generous uh, too, to um, put your work out there as a score um, and not know how it's going to be responded to. But it, it kind of has this continued life yeah, it has a, Charo, as you well know, a continued life, but a different life every place that it yeah. visits. <laughs> and part of that life is that, you know, there's also a curatorial score to the organizing curator or the host curator, and that that in this case was you. And that was, or is the, the prompt to commission a work or works, local work or works. Because one of the things I think that we realized, Dylan, as we started working is that wherever soundings went, it had to be responsive. It had to be responsive to, um, you know, as, as you said in your initial uh, question, Charo, to land and language, to that interrelationship between land and language, because that's also integral to, if you, you know, think about more broadly what the decolonial movement is. Um, but I also think that it's absolutely necessary as well because in some ways, I was excited by the idea that I might not know how someone's going to respond in Kamloops or what someone's going to make in Kamloops or what some, someone's going to make in, in uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, for example. Um, and I liked that openness because what I understand, and I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, and Dylan, you have classical music training. I do not, but I'm, I'm married to a composer. And one of the things that he tells me a lot about scores is is that you can put them out there as a kind of framework, but you can't always control exactly how they'll be interpreted. So there's that kind of space of interpretation that we deliberately tried to build into this. And I think artists deliberately did that in a lot of their works as well. The way that Peter Morin's piece, for example, is played by different players. Uh, so far, you know, the, the instruction is that it's played on strings. Um, that Tanya Willard's, um, work that is a kind of score of a hybrid between uh, a, a beadwork from, from a bandolier bag, as well as, you know, the, the kind of interstitial spaces in her wood pile gets, gets interpreted by different musicians. And for me, it's that actually, it's that space of interpretation that I think is super important. Mm. Sorry, um, I'd also I'd also add to that. I did the opposite. I put mute on rather than taking it off. Um, but I'd also add to that that um, there are uh, you know choices that happen along the way that that we are surprised by. You know that um, you know where where an artist says and Peter Morin, I think is a good case in this instance. I understand the person performing his score is not a string instrument performer at all, and so artists also have the flexibility to think about. Um, how the work needs to change against their original intentions, perhaps, and that, so that's an instance of this, and and you know change, you know because perhaps they know someone, as was the case in this in this instance, um, that is the right person to perform this work. Um, so I really value that ability to to let things move in very different directions. Or for example, at the Belkin, Olivia Wheatung's piece was 
um, was used as a larger score. Uh, it was never created to be a score for music performance, but um, Lorna Brown and uh, uh, Bar Barbara Cole, you know, folks at, at the Belkin there said, well, what if, what if, you know, we, we think about this as something that has that kind of life as well and so approached Olivia and of course that she she loved that idea and so things also change in ways that are so far out of the way that Candace and I originally and the artists conceive of of the works to begin with and I think that's really interesting because one of the I think one of the challenges with touring shows is that you know after a certain point it feels like things get a little bit static or you know the theme the the kind of original curatorial intent that started five years ago really you know is it doesn't doesn't feel as 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 um you know connected to what's going on in the world. But in this instance, that can, a kind of connection and evolving of, of, of work to, to suit the, the you know, very particular and local needs uh, is always possible. And so I, I, I love that that is something that, um, you know, it, it's a challenge also to, to do that, to do that work. But I think it's also the richness of, of, the, um, of the exhibition to be able to respond in that way. Yeah, and I would say part of that came for me, the surprise and by how artists uh, were identifying or defining for them what a score is. You know, I think that in my mind, I had a more rigid or limited idea of what scores were. You know, they were different forms of notation or they were instructional. And as soon as Tanya Luke and Linklater said, well, why can't we understand this Ringa Parka, you know, as a score in and of itself, like not just thinking of its, its kind of adornments or formal lines that it uses in, the, in this parka uh, that came from the Manitoba Museum that was shown in the Agnes Etherington, but also, you know, its journey, its history, what it communicates. And as soon as that happened, then of course everything opened up. And it was also very funny to me that, um, Raven Chacon and Crystal Ball Martinez and in, in their work, a song often played on the radio, the score came after the fact and, and Raven is, is oh. as well as Suzanne Kite. There's a few, um, there's a few trained composers in the mix, but for him, that was actually kind of <laughs> something that came after, um, after they did the actual project. So I think that that, that was a kind of important element is if, if you really expand the idea of what a score is, then the interpretations of what that score is or potentially is become almost kind of limitless in, in a way. And then you have these other interpretations, let's say, or, or potential applications like Olivia Wheatung's piece, which it really is. It's to me, it's a sonic artifact, uh, in fact, that then was reinterpreted um, as a score. So yeah, just to add that. <laughs> Well, we're the, so we're the fifth venue on the tour and there will be more. Um, it must really feel like the exhibition has a life of its own at this point. I don't know if you imagined it would go on this long or um, manifest in the way that it has. <laughs> Well, we, I mean, the, um, the intention of working with Independent Curators International was always that the exhibition would tour at least until 2023. Mm -hmm. um, COVID put a, you know, a bit of a, slowed that down to a certain extent, but, um, you know, we, it, it will, it'll continue and it will go into places that we can't predict yet. But I think also that's really the exciting part for me is that we can, um, because then the show, one of the other intentions of the show is that it, um, that it accumulate, you know, that, 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 that the kind of um, the presence of Indigenous work and process and language just sort of keeps, keeps pushing at the, at the boundaries of of what the exhibition is and and even what can be held um you know within within the certain within the space and and there are works that actually move outwards you know into public space as well which is great mm -hmm. but um, i i i like <laughs> even even now at his fifth iteration you know there's a certain unwieldiness to um you know to all of the things that have accumulated and grown and changed in different ways 
and um, you know it, it does make it you know a potentially challenging um, exhibition to to feel like you have a handle on. But I think that's also the excitement around it, you know that that there's um, that things are are constantly coming into new relations and shifting. And so I'm I'm really excited. And Candice and I also haven't been able to travel to see the exhibition. Wow. You know, since since COVID started, and even a little before that, and so I'm I'm excited for the next time I can physically uh, be in the exhibition and see how things have changed well beyond what you know the last time I saw it at, which was the Agnes Etherington, I think. No, I saw it at Gund. I saw the Gund Gallery. Yeah. Yeah, I've only seen it at the Agnes, which so, seems so strange because it's such an I'm so intimate with this project. But um, Charo, I also wanted to recognize what what you brought. To, to this and that are two really significant uh, commissions, one by Gary Godfordson, the other by Aaron. I wondered if if it would make sense to speak about that given that you are, you know, this venue, um, fifth venue, and mm -hmm. also you've done a lot of really ambitious performances and they were intended to be public and had to, you know, quite shiftly swiftly shift to video. I'm thinking of, of Raven's American Ledger for one. Um, but I was just curious if you wanted to share more about, about that. Yeah, I was thinking actually about Gary's work when we were talking about land acknowledgement, um, because that's kind of how we approached um, our invitation to him. Uh, so it's a work that you experience once you enter our building. And I know we also were talking about it being the exterior score that you've um, used as a way of addressing the architecture. Um, and we have, um, we are in a shared building with a library and a regional district offices. It's a public building and um, there's a space when you enter that's kind of this, um, there's Gary's work, thanks Emily. Um, it, it's kind of an uh, empty space. And so we've taken over this, made this triangle space. And um, so we invited Gary to write kind of a, a land acknowledgement. And he spoke to us a lot about um, the connection between land and, and language. And so you'll actually hear his poem, Land and Language, in um, spoken uh, by Gary in English and um, then also by um, Dr. Janice uh, Dick Billy, who did the translation, the written translation, and she speaks uh, Shikomek Sheen. So potentially you can stand there, read both languages and listen to them and learn the language as you come in. And um, so I like that this exists um, kind of in a way like a, a placing the land um, and the petroglyph is, is from uh, this territory. Um, and it's, um, if I'm remembering correctly, um, a figure calling to the heavens and also rooted in the earth below um, and on this kind of shape of an Al-Qaed. Um, so yeah, that, it was really nice also to bring in a poet to work with because um, language is his medium. Yeah, and you know, when we were talking about how sound can be a tool for decolonization, like I don't know, Charo, you know, perhaps the last time that Sequoia Machine was, you know, amplified in, in the lobby. And I was also thinking actually of amplification as one of the things that I think is used by um, certain of the artists in the exhibition very precisely. And certainly, you know, I, I see this in, in Gary's work and, and also to speak to that role of, you know, Dylan, you wrote the first outdoor curatorial score at the Agnes and you had a line in there. And I think Charo, I, I don't wanna prefigure a question, but there's a line in there that I that has stuck with me ever since then. And that's was this prompt, you prompted the reader of this outdoor curatorial score to listen beyond the colonial hum and I know you're responding to the architecture of Queens, uh, which a lot of it is, you know, this very particular kind of, I think it's limestone, but that never left my mind, that idea that, you know, these, these hums are everywhere, actually. They condition us. They likely are in our ears when we're not aware that they are in our ears. And it just made me think, you know, 
what are the other possible soundscapes? So then, you know, Char, when you're speaking about Gary's work, I think that that's one other possible soundscape you know, that is being produced or amplified. Yeah, and Aaron Leon's work, which is in the gallery, is also an invitation to listen to the land. So it's um, a multi, there we go, <laughs> um, a, a video installation and um, the sound, you hear the sound of the river and the wind, a lot of wind in it, and Aaron's grandmother speaking um, the in Chukwamakshtin, the glottal stop words, which you see are here with the seven. And I guess the phonetic alphabet originally, I couldn't, didn't, we didn't have a way of spelling that out. So we've got the seven or a funny looking kind of question mark in those words. And so that was what Aaron was working with. And we created um, a really discreet kind of room so that the experience is really, um, it's this altered landscape for sure, but you're, you feel quite immersed in the sounds and then thinking about directly that, that connection between those sounds of the land <clears throat> and the language itself. And that's what Gary was um, getting at too, is that those things are totally in interconnected. Um, and that's maybe hard for us to understand from a, a colonizer perspective. <laughs> Uh, we renamed everything and 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 just and made these kind of lines around territories and borders and yeah it's not about where you find fish or, or your saskatoon berries anymore right i think it's one of the really important things that we need to um do do more of uh, within uh public spaces and exhibitions make space for those sounds for language learners who that's one of the more, more challenging things because in the, the hegemony of english right is is isn't just the fact that we use this for communicating and writing um but just in a lot of our it it, it exists as a sort of the whiteness of public space and um you know, to 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 occupy or to have the presence of our languages and the sounds of our languages um, in all spaces is just really really an important thing for for language learners. But I think for everyone to to understand, um, you know, the way that that communicates information about, like you're saying, about our about our lands and our um, you know conveys our our knowledge through that sound, not just through its content, right? So and and of course you know it's just so so beautiful to hear those glottal stops and and um, so so fun also to learn them as a as a language learner, you know to actually have you ask your 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 mouth to to reorient itself to uh, produce. I'm, I'm speaking as a language learner myself. I mean, for those that have some fluency or, or complete fluency within the language, this isn't the case. But you know, to to spend an entire six months just learning how to hiss or, or make soft X sounds um, is, is profound. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so I, really, I really value the ways that this has taken a, a focus here in, the, in the, the new works that have joined the exhibition from, um, from the Kamloops Art Gallery. Um, you know, I had a, a few questions here that we've, we've already covered. Um, I thought maybe I would loop back to this idea of listening. Um, so when you, before you even enter the gallery, you're um, invited to please listen by Sebastian Deline's work. Um, and um, Dylan, I was thinking about in the introduction to your book, Hun Hungry Listening, you start with an explanation of the title in which you refer to a settler's starving orientation. Um, my mind went to the American artist Arthur Jaffa's video montage, Love is the Message, the Message is Death. Um, he points to this tension between the desire to consume African American culture um, while we still maintain systemic racism. And, um, and then I was doing some further reading of a Canadian art uh, magazine article where the artist Jordan Brown wrote about this work and he asked, can institutions center Black experience without feeding into colonial imaginings of us? 
Um, so of course, this has me thinking about my role at a public institution in supporting artists and engaging audiences, how we position ourselves as producers of exhibitions and consumers of exhibitions. And um, Dylan, um, I know that um, this is a whole talk in itself, but maybe you can speak to this in terms of your work on audiation and positionality. And Candace, I was also thinking about um, how important context and audience is in um, the site-specific curatorial projects that you do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I will. I can try briefly. <laughs> and I know we want to get questions in. For yes, yes, for sure. Too. Um, I mean, I so so um, yeah. In in this this larger work, this book that I've written called um, "Hungry Listening," I think about the history, our history of uh, newcomers, settlers coming to our our lands, and the first major influx of of settlers to our lands was during the gold rush in the early to mid 1800s and you know by the thousands so there's a there's a, a documentation of of some of these numbers shifting from 300 in um, 300 settlers mostly Hudson's Bay folks to um, 30,000 over the period of a few months um, and some of those folks moved further north or inland or along the coast um, but this is a really significant shift. So, so we perceive this ship, shift um, as, as a kind of hunger, you know, hunger for space, right? Um, but more particularly hunger through gold fever, right? For, for you know, panning for, for gold and accumulation of wealth. That I think still persists as, a, as an orientation, as a kind of hunger for something, as a, um, the, the desire for accumulation, for accumulating wealth and for accumulating knowledge. And also within a museum system of accumulating, um, you know, the sounds of indigenous folks that were apparently, you know, um, dying away and, and as, as a record, right? But not for us. And so not a record, not, not being held for our future generations, which is what, you know, those who shared these songs originally wanted. So anyways, I, I'm thinking, I've been thinking a lot about the ways in which this hunger um, is, a, is a state that we all you know, we all live in to a certain to a certain extent. This hunger to accumulate knowledge, to accumulate artworks. How is the gallery system implicated in this this kind of of hunger? Um, that isn't that isn't a isn't about the reciprocal, uh, you know, giving back or or mutual sustenance, right? So, what happens when we come together to um, mutually sustain each other, right? To feed each other, to take part in feasting, or what is the work that we're doing that isn't um, primarily an accumulation of something that the other offers to be taken up and held by us, right? But instead, uh, some some kind of relationship. And I think. I mean, yeah, that's what a lot of these works, the, these works call for a relationship in, in soundings in, in many different forms um, and really pushes against that, that idea that an artwork can be a fact or a, a kind of provide a history or can raise consciousness because I'm not saying that those things are, are, are in and of themselves bad, but those are the things that can quite often just be um, taken as an object and then we're done. Right, rather than a reciprocation or or a kind of requirement to do something. Um, so yeah, I I think uh, I think it's really important to think about how we how we consume and how we consume through listening. Yeah, and Dylan, you've put out this idea, and it was actually a series of talks uh, against hungry listening, and that is also you know as far as I understand it, uh, the idea that you know, oftentimes when we're hearing something or we think we're hearing something, we're also trying to condition what we want to hear. We're also conditioned, sorry, by what we want to hear. Um, so I've thought about that a lot. I've thought about how even the act that we think is, you know, maybe not filtered, even the act of, of sound can be highly filtered by what we might want. Um, and I definitely understand that as well, you know, coming from a place that was also heavily affected by the gold rush, in this case, the Klondike gold rush, 1898, um, into uh, 
the area of Car Cross. It used to stand for Caribou Crossing, but the Caribou stopped going there even before the big gold rush because so many gold seekers were already in that region. So they had already, you know, changed the migration route of the Caribou because they're really sensitive to those things. Um, but there was the same description that, you know, and I think in our own ways, we actually have, there was a prophecy that circulated at the time uh, and it was called Ko'ochen, or they were called Ko'ochen or the cloud people, because what um, medicine people saw at the time was that they saw that the world was turning white. Uh, white meaning uh, kind of metaphorically, as well as the color that, and what he, they said was that the color was going to drain from our faces too, that it was, the color was draining from the sea or from the fish, from the trees everything was turning white and it was, it was like an affliction. And so what they understood right, rightly then, very, very rightly was that this kind of capitalist desire is an affliction. It, 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 it affects, you know, our bodies and our minds and we're still, we're in it now. And it's a very, very hard cycle to break. Um, so I became really interested in, in these, um, stories and these prophecies of that time because they were trying to think through it. They were trying to think about how you rupture that, how you rupture that cycle. And even someone like Edward Said has said that this is, capitalism is a cycle that's been spinning since the Renaissance and it comes from imperialism. And it's that insatiable need from his words of resources and future resources. So it's something that if you give it more resources, it actually only wants more. <laughs> and, you know, your people obviously saw that right away too. Um, so yeah, that's something I think about a lot, but also, you know, you had brought up, and I've always wanted to ask you, Dylan, you brought up this concept in your book too called, where you were calling the settler's ear. And I've been thinking so much about what, you know, the decolonial ear might be, but I was curious to know more about the, you, you know, your ideas of the settler's ear. Yeah, the, I think you're probably referring to the tin ear, the tin ear. Oh, maybe. Of, um, <laughs> which, which comes from, uh, so the Delmogook versus the Queen, uh, uh, the, the land claim trial with, between Wet'suwet'en and um, Gitsan people, uh, and the crown, and the way in which the testimony of during that trial from Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en and folks was need it needed to be given through song um, and through oral history and stories, and the judge refused to uh, to listen to listen to songs because he said, you know, uh, songs, I will not, this is a court of law. This isn't a performance space. Your songs will do you no good to sing to me. He thought he was, you know, that they were trying to win him over through the aesthetic beauty of their songs. And really it was just simply because the knowledge was contained within the songs um, and the songs were legal orders, the equivalent, not exactly the equivalent, but, you know, Gitsan and wetsuit and um, ways of demonstrating their relationship to the lands so that they were part of you know what they were being asked to demonstrate um horribly so within a western court system and uh one of the one of the people who was at a settler um, whose name is walt taylor was um you know writing about some of his experience witnessing some of this testimony in the in the trial and he said um, all of us um, Canadians listen with a tin ear. We cannot hear what we don't know how to recognize. It's paraphrasing a little bit, but it really stayed with me to think about this kind of tin ear. And there's a wonderful, wonderful comic by Don Monet, which is um, the Justice McEachern with a with a kind of um, a tin of something like a canned salmon or something on it over his ear, and uh, Mary Johnson, Elder Mary Johnson, with a can opener, saying, "Oh, it's okay, Your Highness, I'll open, <laughs> I'll open this." So, so thinking about like what kind of can openers we need, right, for for the tin ears of of settler colonialism that don't allow us to recognize what song is as more than aesthetic, right? And so it's a it's a really pertinent question. Like, how do we, uh, you know, because to many folks outside of indigenous communities, it's a stretch, I think, to understand song's capacity as equivalent to law. You know, as the equivalent to something that would be held within a thick law 
tome, right? And or 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 as medicine, right? But but it's it's very it is our history <laughs> to conceive of of song in such a way and to have song act as different things. So, you know, what are the what are the ways in which we need to um, help develop can openers for ten years? Um, through through exhibitions and artwork and and uh, all kinds of discussions, I think yeah, there, are, like, there are many. Listening otherwise, Dylan. Like I remember, I just after McKickern's ruling, um, I was working as an archivist at Treaty Eight Tribal Association in Fort St. John for uh, really quite well known um, land claims lawyers who had worked on what was called the Obsassin case. Um, uh, or Indian Reserve, I think it was 188. And that was the, it, it, it ruled to be the illegal sale of that reserve to veterans returning from the First World War, get, given the argument at the time that um, that land was not being quote unquote used or farmed, let's say. Um, and it was land belonging to uh, folks from Doig River First Nation and, and other communities. Um, but that was the legal grounding that, that proved that the government actually had a fiduciary responsibility to act in the best interests as well in, uh, for First Nations. But going back to McKickern, which was always, what struck me when I read that and read about him was that in fact, what he was demonstrating often was his profound ignorance but what was so threatening as well, and I think he saw it, what was so threatening as well was that song, story, and dance are inextricably linked to the land. So they themselves are like a performance of land claims. So if you're to say that they have no, no place in the, in the courts of law, then you can sort of say that, the, that there's no sort of grounds for this. But I think they realized really quickly that that was the grounds, those were the grounds. Yeah, and and also it's it's really interesting to compare uh, the uh, Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en understanding of that legal order. Um, this is not really my area. This is the work of, of Val Napoleon, um, who, who's a really amazing Indigenous legal legal scholar um, at University of Victoria. But um, she draws on some of the ways that the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en folks understand legal orders, um, their legal orders, as only being um, felicitous or only being real as legal orders because they are felt and because they have a felt connection to land and place. And so in a sense, if we were to flip the scenario, <laughs> you know, we could also say that Western legal orders were not had no had no grounding, <laughs> literally and figuratively, right? In the sense that they are disconnected in their presentation from the land, they are they are in their in their writing in their kind of thick tomes of of texts, they're disconnected, right? From from a way of knowing uh, the land. So I, I yeah I think absolutely, Candice, it's it's important to understand the ways that we grant legitimacy, or you know we, but I mean. You know, society grants legitimacy to um, you know legal kinds of law, kinds of medicine, right? Through through um, what what so-called real knowledge is and how it's presented, right? But for Gitsan, Wetsuit, and folks, it's only it only has legitimacy because it can be felt. Because and and I'm trying to remember the actual way. Um, I think it's James Morrison puts it, but you know, it's only it's only it only contains our connection to this place or it's only legal i'm struggling to find the right wor equivalent words here because we are brought back through listening to the song to those lands that we are stewards of that's the only reason that it is law we have a work in our collection here by Teresa marshall called cultural briefs it's it's completely apropos because um, there are, um, I think, uh, six different briefcases that are made out of deer hides and they function as drums. It's such a beautiful work and they're meant to be displayed on the floor low and you can open them up and then they have, um, you know, different objects that you can play the drums with. <laughs> yeah. Such a brilliant work. Charles. It is. <laughs> I have it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So I see that we're nearing one o'clock here. I just wanted to encourage all of you out there listening to um, add your questions, if you have them, to the Q&A box. Um, I have other questions, but um, I see we have we have one question. We could we could start with that if if you guys are ready. <laughs> oh, we've lost Dylan now. <laughs> You know, I just had to plug in my computer. <laughs> I, was gonna, I feel like it would have been lost. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, we have a question about the future of the exhibition. Um, what direction can you see this exhibition going on the map and in, in the works, I guess, in, in the exhibition itself? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> it's an open-ended answer <laughs> in a way because um, the way that the tour works really is um, particularly Becky, give a shout out to Becky Noam at ICI, Independent Curators International, uh, is in dialogue and approaches different um, galleries and museums, uh, not just through Canada, although I think you know it's been most popular in Canada, but also in the US and uh, potentially even Australia or Otoroa, New Zealand, um, to see where it goes next. What we do is that we then start a conversation with those um, host curators to you know talk through it because it's not a conventional exhibition. Like that, you're getting kind of the nuts and bolts here, but. Um, so it requires, I think, a different kind of orientation, but I think anyone interested in it already knows. And then we speak through the, if there's the ability to commission an artist and what that might look like, how we can support that. In some cases, we might know the artist who um, curators working with. So, but, you know, from my, from my end, I think that that process really then, you know, is, and that relationships developed between a host curator and an artist there and the work really transpires through their conversation and their works. And for me, that's really interesting because I don't know then what's gonna be added. And then a big part of the exhibition every time too is the different performances and participants who come on through performances. And I wanted to mention before too, is that, you know, some of those events are, are more closed or more private, in fact, uh, on purpose. Some are very public. Uh, some have been for the pandemic, you know, online only events. But one of the ideas that Dylan had right from the beginning was that we need to find a way of archiving them. So the archive also becomes part of the exhibition. So there are videos that travel with the exhibition where these performances are, are filmed, where you can listen to them, where you can see them. Um, so that's a really long roundabout answer to say that we do have some other venues on the books they are not confirmed yet and there will be more commissions. And every time it's installed, it looks different because things are added like Olivia Weetungs will always have another beaded loom piece added. And, and I think that that um, improvisation is, is part of the heart of the exhibition. Yeah, it's just going to need bigger and bigger venues, <laughs> potentially. Uh, we have a very thoughtful, long question here from Kim, Kim Smith, who uh, is working with Emily Hope here. Um, and she says, we are a group of early childhood educators who are engaging with soundings. Thank you. It's uh, been really provocative thus far and our conversations and engagements with the reverberations from your work will continue this after this talk. Uh, we're wanting to bring your work into dialogue with our work in early childhood spaces. One of the things that we talk about a lot in early childhood spaces is the need to shift our ways of listening from checking boxes and looking for the known to a more open-ended listening practice. Um, in seeking to nourish and cultivate spaces of rich listening practices that is inviting invited in soundings. I'm wondering about the ways you see the reverberations of soundings happening beyond the gallery walls in ways that respond back to the exhibition that might uh, help us understand more about the ways that reconceptualizing listening for and with children uh, may extend beyond the walls of childcare and early learning spaces. I love this question, Kim. You're actually working at a daycare where my son goes, so. 
I think Dylan and Char are the obvious <laughs> people to have for this, only because, you know, I have a niece, but yeah. I don't have children myself, but you yeah, both. Go ahead, Dylan. <laughs> have you thought about that? Thank you. Thank you so much for this question. Um, my daughter, Chloe, is four, and uh, I have a, a new, new baby on the way, and so I think a lot about um, not necessarily early childhood education, but my own, you know, children's uh, experiences of of the arts and and listening as well and i'm just you know i'm always so struck by by the um uncensored uh nature of how children express both vocally and in terms of working things out in their, like learning the world right through what they see and what they hear and making those connections that you know i think unfortunately sometimes adults can clamp down on because they're not the proper ones or they're not, you know, they're not quite, quite right sometimes. Um, but I, but I also think, you know, it's the perfect opportunity for thinking about these kinds of questions about what it means to listen to the lands, right? And so what it might mean just to sit on the grass and listen to listen to the trees or the or the the grass or the things that can't be heard even and think imaginatively about connections to that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of potential there to, to think about the, the work of, of listening from an early childhood perspective as being very expansive and, and that we can learn so much, right, from the way that our children express how they listen and what they're listening to um, and what it's like to listen, where we haven't already built in those filters for um sorting out the right from the wrong, right? So I, your, your question just really excites me in terms of the capacities that children have for um, understanding the world. Yeah, my son is also four. So um, you'll know, Dylan, I mean, the, the depth of those questions that you um, don't think about on a daily basis, like talking about death, um, like big, big questions, they start emerging at this age. And um, as you were talking too about um, learning language, like this exhibition is, is perfect for kids who are just, you know, they're still learning their, their native tongue, but can easily pick up languages. I mean, my, my son sat in front of Aaron Leon's work and started to say the words himself. And it's just natural growth, right? Their minds are just expanding all the time. <laughs> um, I think I would mention just quickly, I don't know if this is helpful or not, but uh, when uh, I was working as a curator for Documenta 14, before the exhibition started, we did a school, we call it the School of Listening. Um, and I think, you know, what amazing potential there might be for a school of listening for young children. These were, these were students who were already in art school, but we would start with these warm ups. We called them warm ups, where we would notate in whatever way you wanted, because not everyone had, uh, you know, musical training. Um, everything we heard, whether it was a tiny, you know, chirp of a bird or wheels going by or someone whispering to someone else, and it was just a nice way to, you know, to attune ourselves, um, because I feel like the older we get, the more filters we have, uh, and that includes in our ears. Tanya Willard mentioned um, a part of your process early on with the artists in the exhibition too, was to each bring something that made sound. Um, that sounded uh, fun, like <laughs> adding play, right, into the process. Um, yeah, we asked them, everyone to bring a sound and introduce themselves through that sound uh, instead of sort of the usual way, you know, and because it, it just has a different, I guess, I, it, it, Dylan, to, to your point, there's a different kind of relationality maybe that that sets up rather than the kind of usual, you know, bios or the way that we might kind of fall into a habit of introducing ourselves a certain way that um, kind of broke, broke through that for sure. Uh -huh. um, um, we have another question here, a uh, couple questions, um, and I'll just continue to read them out. Um, Will Oyle asks, is there space for settler curators to handle Indigenous artworks in a non-collaborative way, perhaps without Indigenous voices? Is it ethical to commission Indigenous artworks as a settler curator? 
And what might a settler curator do with traditional works that have historically defined the Western canon of Canadian art history, like say the group of seven? Can soundings tell us anything in this regard? I want to take on parts of this, so Dylan, I'm sure you have. No, I was just say. thinking they're very different answers. <laughs> questions so we might need to work through them one by one well, depending on your positionality right we get questions I ask myself of course yeah yeah it's uh, well thank you for this question um the first one I wanted to, is the first question I wanted to answer is there space for settler curators to handle indigenous artworks in a non-collaborative way, perhaps without indigenous voices. And I would say that the way I see my practice as a curator is I collaborate with everything I show, not just the artist, but the object as well. I think it's possible to think about the agency of an object, particularly indigenous, uh, indigenous if they're cultural belongings. But if you're working with a cultural belonging, my perspective is you need to work with folks from the community where that comes from. Also because so many things as they entered collections came with no information. They came with information about the collector, but never often about the maker or even the function of, um, of a cultural belonging. And of course, if you're going to work with indigenous art by living artists, you wanna work with those artists, let's say. That would be the answer to the first one. <laughs> I can go through them or Dylan, did you want to? Well, I, we, can, we can go back and forth maybe. <laughs> I mean, so, so the question of, is it ethical to commission indigenous artworks as a settler curator? I mean, I think, I think the question of it being ethical maybe misses um, a bit of the, I mean, the, the important part here is the potential, I think, for settler curators to work with Indigenous artists and Indigenous communities and develop relationships. So, and that doesn't necessarily mean um, jumping right to the commissioning of an artwork. I mean, I think these things um, can and should be longer processes of uh, getting to know one another, of visiting, of of learning, and 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 by, you know, in from from both sides here, because I mean, there are there are many Indigenous folks that don't feel welcome within gallery spaces, and so you know, I, I think this is a reciprocal um, kind of relationship building process that can lead to oh well, this is this is why the gallery is a is a exciting space, or this is can we can we you know create a space within the gallery that makes a different sense of feeling welcome um, so that we can have more relationship and that we can we can start talking together and then maybe eventually uh, move towards creating a work or I'm talking about this from a community perspective but maybe it's also with an individual and artist where you, where you start developing that relationship that doesn't jump right into um, I'd love a work <laughs> because because then because then it just feels again it falls into that that kind of category of hunger or production right for the sake of a work rather than for the sake of a relationship or an ongoing practice i think that's the other part of it too is that once that you know if there is a commission um that that also necessitates a, a, a an ongoing relationship it doesn't necessarily mean that that relationship has to sort of be at the same intensity or always the kind of same timeline of checking in or visiting but but there is a relationship there to think about some you know, know what next yeah uh yeah and just to to add to that um you know if settler curators weren't commissioning indigenous artists we wouldn't have a ton of commissions to be totally frank you know most native curators still work independently there's very few who are in institutional positions it's an issue in canada it's a bigger issue in the united states um so just to say that like you know i i i don't want to advocate for segregated spaces uh, either or the feeling that you know you can't work with an artist because they come from a different culture venue i work with artists from very different backgrounds all the time through all of the work that that i do and as dylan already laid out it's just you know it is about at its core relationship building um saying that this this next question <laughs> is is also really exciting and interesting to me. And that's, you know, your question about what a settler might, curator might do with works that have defined the canon of Canadian art, let's say like the group of seven. Um, the way I would answer that is those paintings were paintings of indigenous absence largely. 
there's a big, there's a good reason for that. One, they were paintings that were inscribing a national narrative that was tethered to a kind of empty land that was for white settler desire, let's say. You know, Marcia Crosby writes about that really well in her essay on the imaginary Indian. Um, and of course, you know, why, why or why not? Emily Carr was pretty obsessed about making drawings of grave sites of native, uh, of, of native grave sites of villages that had been emptied. Um, because of you know pandemics and colonial violence. Um, so I think the reframing of those paintings is absolutely urgent and necessary. It's starting to happen. Um, it was starting to happen uh, I, just before I joined the National Gav Canada, they did a rehang of their permanent collection and a rethink, the most radical rethink I would say since the National Gallery had ever open, opened. And that was an exhibition called Art, Art of This Land because the narrative of Canadian art history was really centered on the group of seven. But for the first time, they had to borrow a lot of these cultural belongings because there weren't in the collection of the National Gallery. Uh, so they borrowed very early examples of art being made uh, all throughout Canada from the very beginnings of when, you know, this work was surviving. Because a lot of work by Indigenous artists is also made out of materials that don't necessarily always last, they're organic, let's say hide is organic, um, or something on a piece of wood is very organic, but it doesn't mean that that art history doesn't exist, it just means we don't always have some of those examples. So a lot of works were stone, bone, um, horn, you know, things like that. Uh, but that was the first time that at the national institution, they had ever tried to change that narrative and that timeline. To me, it was pretty profound. So they worked with an advisory group and one of the members of that advisory group was Tom Hill, one of the first native curators to begin working in Canada. He worked on the Indians of Canada Pavilion um, in the, at Expo 67. Uh, he put together different protocols. So for example, if an item was always meant to be tethered to the land, it would be shipped by ground. It would never be shipped by air, for example. When items came to the gallery, they were opened respectfully. If there needed to be a ceremony, that happened. So all of a sudden you had a change where the protocols of belongings were um, being adhered to. Uh, and that made a major shift. So I think there's a lot of possibility in rereading these. You could consider them to be settler colonial landscapes. Um, and to me, that's super exciting and anyone can do it. You can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> Um, just before we move to, we've got a couple more questions. Um, from my perspective as a settler curator, the, um, these questions are incredibly important. And I would say um, it, was, it was critical for me to meet with every artist in Soundings um, to develop those relationships and to reach out with them. Um, and um, we also, um, really benefited from great conversations with uh, cultural advisors like Gary Godfredson and Greg Stotts was incredibly um, generous with his time as well and Chris Bowes who is a local artist here um, in guiding us and um, absolutely that's that's part of the, the process and I'm grateful to be able to develop those relationships. And that's what why Soundings is different than any other tour as well, right? Um, so any curators interested in, in hosting Soundings, that would be the first advice that I would have for you, absolutely. <laughs> um, but Charo, I, I would say, you know, you're being a bit humble because you already had <laughs> many of these relationships too, right? So. True, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's a it's a long process. Um, you know, with uh, with Greg Stotts, he um, worked with our staff, so we kind of had a private program with him. It was, you know, a couple hours of talking with him, um, and I wished that I could have um, set that up with every artist, um, so that you know, I I get more uh, opportunity to have that connection and build build those relationships with artists than all of the other staff here. And I know that they all just, um, they understood his work really, really well. And why, for example, we, we 
bring it into the gallery and um, I perform the work. Like um, he really uh, got to the heart of, of welcoming that, that work and why those protocols are important. So yeah, it's good work. <laughs> Um, Daniela Ofi, who is a local musician and who is actually has developed a public program that is a sound walk for soundings. She has a question here for us. Uh, she was also one of the performers of American Ledger, Raven Chacon's work. Um, she asks, I'm wondering if one or both of you could share one of the more unexpected responses to a score in soundings and how did that interpretation push the boundaries of limitless listening in non-settler ways. I I remember, well, I should also say that because because of COVID, Candace and I haven't been, <laughs> been traveling to yeah. and, and have had limited access to, to audience responses um, for the works more recently. But I remember back at the Agnes Etherington Art Center. One of the um, the res the response to the performance of Raven Chacon's uh, outdoor score, American Ledger, um, was really interesting because the un unlike some of unlike the instance in at Kamloops where it was um, you know the much larger forces, uh, orchestral musicians, you had. Um, a smaller, actually, I noticed that Carol Sawyer was was in the was in the chat here, and and so Carol was one of the performers of the of the first instance of of this being done in um, in Kingston, and it was a smaller group, and it was in the middle of the winter, and you know it was outside, and everyone was just kind of you know huddled huddled up in their in their warmest warmest gear, and striking a match. Right. And, and so, you know, as one one part of the score and and, you know, I think the the stakes felt quite high there just because of the, uh, you know, of the temperature and the, the you know, the, the, the smallness of the of the performing ensemble, but also the striking of a match in the middle of winter. There's just a lot of of really wonderful um, questioning of like and this was the inaugural performance as well so um I, I i should say i was i was surprised um in the in in my um understanding of the work because looking at it as a score it has a it has a kind of um a larger presence to it like visually the, the what's what's called for has a larger presence than i think certain iterations of its actual performance might have and in this case i would say that the sonic um the, the sounds that were made in that in that moment were um were quieter they were they they kind of dissipated also because of the space it wasn't a it wasn't a, a perfect acoustic space but the visual impact of the performance was really um uh, you know, sort of held up as as surprising and large um, because of those stakes that I mentioned earlier, and so it was a really wonderful, um, you know, one, wonderful piece to to witness there, and then see its its very very different performance in every location since has been really equally as exciting. Um, Lorna Brown, I don't know if you're still with us. Uh, she had to jump off to another meeting, but I, I'm just seeing now that Lorna's at it um, in the chat. Um, Lorna was the curator at the Belkin Art Gallery that hosted soundings previous to us. Um, she said, I'm interested in what you were saying about the Renaissance. There's a lot of conversation about its relationship to the plague as a score for major social change. Could you speculate on the COVID pandemic as a turning point or a score for social change? Yeah, Lorna's always very astute. <laughs> when I was reading the um, question in, in the chat, I've been thinking about it ever since um, because I hadn't heard that, you know, and of course I'm sure it's true. Um, and I was talking about the Renaissance before because of, you know, its relationship to, to imperialism, of course, uh, the ways in which the, so the wealth of the Americas, the gold that was pillaged, uh, particularly by the Spanish, helped fuel the Renaissance. A lot of people don't realize how those economies right from the beginning were completely tethered 
um, we like to think of them as separate, but they're not separate at all. Um, speculating on how the COVID pandemic might be a turning point or a score for social change. I think for me, it's been a way to reevaluate my relationship to home, to land, to my value system. Uh, that's definitely been it for, for me. It's also made me change the way we do certain things within exhibitions, thinking about you know what resources it takes to travel, um, both environmentally, physically, mentally, how we might be able to do things better and differently, how exhibitions might be able to have a lighter footprint. And this is, I realize this, this is a kind of contradiction given that this is a kind of touring exhibition, but that's a consideration as well, how things can move lightly on the land. And I get a lot of that you know, knowledge and thinking through different people I'm in, in conversation with and mentors, including Cheryl Rondell, who's in the exhibition. She thinks about that. Uh, very deeply. Um, so all that to say, uh, I don't see that necessarily as a score, but sort of a, for me, just a kind of re reevaluation of how I work and the field that I work in and how we can actually move more sustainably. Um, I'll just move on now to a question from artist Wally Dion. Some branches of science delve into these levels of listening. The very large array in New Mexico comes to mind. It's basically the same thing. I feel like both cultures, worldviews meet up in the end, or is that a naive point to make? I don't know, Wally. You need. To, I feel like we need a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know enough. I don't know enough about, um, you know, to be honest, about the science of listening. And and uh, I, you know, I I. But I but I have I have some hesitation around like this sort of pure the you know the purity of of scientific understandings of listening as as not understanding necessarily the cultural um ramifications of what it means to listen through our positionality like to listen um as holmach or as a dad or as a man like what do these things mean i think these really do the our positionalities guide how we listen and that's something i think that that hasn't necessarily um still <laughs> been you know understood within scientific frameworks but i also think that those frameworks are offer other tools, right, for for how we listen. So so I do I consider them quite different, but complementary potentially. Um, uh, but I'm also not not sure if I'm understanding everything about your question. <laughs> yeah, and what I was going to say, I think a lot of the technologies of listening are based on surveillance. So that has a very particular end game. <laughs> it's, you know, to listen in illicitly often, to listen in on people, to, um, to, you know, have power over someone. Like I'm thinking about all the ways in which listening was used, especially in the 60s against Native activists, for example. Uh, not only listening, but also deliberately silencing, like Buffy St. Marie was not, her, her songs weren't allowed to be played on the radio and in fact DJs were received letters thanking them for their role in suppressing her music. Um, so I do I do think that you know science also has ethics, it also has power relations, it also has reasons why it's developing that technology. And those are the questions I always ask, even a very large array, which you know points itself to the stars to listen, what's it listening for and for whose ears. Mm -hmm. We'll have to have another talk about that topic. <laughs> um, I'm aware of the time here. And um, so if there are, I don't see any more questions, um, but lots of great comments in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Um, do, do you have any final thoughts, Candice or Dylan? 
<laughs> no, I think I think just thank you again um, to your staff for all the work that you've done to make the exhibition so successful. And you know, it it, it does it, you know. Uh, it, it, I want to recognize this again, just because it does take a lot of work to what we were mentioning before, um, develop relationships and, you know, let that, let those evolve into something um, that might not even, even be within the scope of the, the exhibition that you're thinking it might be for, right? But, so there's a lot of work in that in addition to all of the planning and performances and, but I want to also say this in order to recognize that I think that that, I mean, my sense of the, what happens from this work is that those connections move well beyond the exhibition um, towards uh, other things that you can't you can't plan in the in the moment, but but ha have a lot of impact and uh, and bearing on future work. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Echoing my thanks. Thank you for sharing this exhibition with us. It's been quite profound on a number of levels um, it, in its challenges too. So um, the exhibition is still up and on until July 3rd. I really encourage people to come and see it. Um, most of the changes that, uh, that have happened uh, so far are now in place, um, but uh, you will see a, a, a few additions um, up in, in this last month. Um, and th there's so much to take in. So um, it's a good place to come and rest actually, and listen. <laughs> um, and just also a few closing remarks as well. Um, do watch for our upcoming programs. Um, you can go to our website, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Kamloops Art Gallery. Um, Kite will be performing virtually this Thursday, June 10th at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Um, and you can register for that on our website. And as I mentioned, Kamloops-based artist uh, Daniela Ofi will be leading a sound walk on June 23rd at 6 p.m. And uh, this audio is also available for any of you out there in the virtual world to download anytime on our website. And finally, a recording of this talk will be available in the coming weeks um, on our website and social media channels. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us in the middle of this afternoon. And it's really, it's just a pleasure to talk to you both. Thank you. Bye, everyone.